Welcome everybody. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathered on today, uh, the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we'd like to pay our respects to the Wurundjeri uh, and thank them for letting us uh, gather here today on this land. And I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to any elders in the room today. Uh, welcome to tonight's special conversations event celebrating International Women's Day. Woo. ACME Conversations explores bold experimental ideas, discussions and debate around the moving image and its connections to the world in which we live, from policy, politics to society, culture and art. Tonight we hear three, um, three powerful local filmmakers and their stories. Tonight's event is being live streamed on YouTube, so we ask that you hold your questions until the end of the session uh, when we'll have a brief Q&A. All right. Um, I would like to welcome our moderator and host for the evening, Aloise Ross. Uh, Aloise is a writer, critic and lecturer with a range of experience working with Melbourne film culture, both in organisational roles and as a qualified speaker. She has a PhD in cinema studies from La Trobe University and her research specialises in sound studies, Hollywood history and the phenomenological experiences of the cinema. Aloise has been widely published as a film critic, cultural commentator and academic. She is a co-curator of the Melbourne Cinematheque, currently teaches in the film department at Swinburne University, and is co-host of the Senses of Cinema podcast. Thank you, Eloise. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, firstly, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and I would also like to extend my respect to those from other nations that might be present here today. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming to this uh, special event today on International Women's Day um, with this wonderful panel. It's great to have an audience who wants to join the conversation, I think, about um, documentary film and celebrate the future of filmmaking in Australia and indeed in the world. Um, so I'll extend my welcome to the three panellists here today, um, these wonderful women. Um, we have Sari Braithwaite is here, uh, first on my left, a filmmaker who works across the disciplines of history and film. Her documentary films have played at MIFF, Sydney Film Festival, Adelaide, Canberra Film Festival, Antenna Film Festival and BFI London. She was a recipient of the 2015 Afters Creative Fellowship to create an experimental work about Australian censorship. Um, in addition to her own practice, Sari has also worked as a professional researcher on a wide variety of film and television documentaries and continues to work in universities as a researcher. Chloe Brugali is a screen practitioner with more than 15 years' experience working across drama and factual productions, distribution, events and festival programming. As the general manager of Robert Connolly's company, Arena Media, Chloe has contributed to many culturally and artistically innovative features, including The Turning Spear and box office hit Paper Planes. She also oversaw the successful release campaign of the documentary Chasing Asylum. Chloe's producer credits include Censored, an experimental documentary by uh, Sari, <laughs> and Black Is Me, a short film by director Santilla Chingape, who is to the left here. So Santilla, <clears throat> excuse me, is an award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker who has spent nearly a decade working for SBS World News, which saw her report from across Africa and interview some of the continent's most prominent leaders. Um, last year, she presented a one-off documentary for SBS, Date My Race. She's currently directing and writing a documentary on the complexities of Australia's South Sudanese community, and her latest film, Black As Me, is a short documentary exploring the perception of beauty and race in Australia. Um, and we will get a chance to talk about all of these projects today. Um, so firstly, to start, I just wanted to raise um, some things that have been written by Patricia White in the book Women's Cinema, World Cinema, Projecting Contemporary Feminisms, published in 2015. Um, Patricia wrote, with the advent of digital filmmaking, women's working documentary is more vital, varied, and widespread than ever. Short film, web-based web media, 
gallery-based fine art, television and popular cinema all represent significant areas of women's production within multiple national and global media fields. Um, documentaries, prestige and institutional supports have increased worldwide, accessing political formations and forms of, the, of creative labour in which women and feminism has flourished. Um, and so I thought that was a good launching point to kind of step off from and talk about documentary practice in Australia, um, accessing kind of global issues and peoples um, that uh, the work of all of these filmmakers accesses. So firstly, I wanted to open the conversation out to all three of you about your um, contributions to documentary filmmaking, because none of you, as we've spoken about, come from a filmmaking background, um, have, any, have had formal training in school. So I wondered what is it about filmmaking and documentaries that make it seem like the most powerful medium to tell your stories? Um, Santilla, maybe you could start. Um, I think for me, documentary, I worked in news for a very long time, still work in news to some extent, but it, uh, I find it to be a very limiting format in how you can contextualise issues and how you can actually bring the awareness of people to some really, really important social issues. And documentary is just a wonderful extension to really consider a lot of the things that I think people should be thinking and talking about. Um, and that's why it appeals to me, and that's why I made that progression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From news to, to documentary yeah, filmmaking yeah, specifically? Yeah, like I, like I just, because news, I mean, when I was working broadcast, you were reacting to a 24 hour news cycle. So you don't have a lot of room for context. Mm -hmm. So many people are coming to stories without necessarily understanding the whys. Um, and also not necessarily realizing that as much as things are happening now, a lot of the things that we're seeing have happened in the past and they're just repeating themselves. And without that base, it's very difficult for people to be properly informed. Mm -hmm. um, and documentary and just filmmaking in general just allows me that opportunity and the space to be able to allow, to bring audiences into some of these issues, to really consider them in ways that I feel like news is failing um, in many ways in that, in that sense. Yeah. Um, mm. Chloe, you come from a background of uh, managing in film festival communities um, and also social work, I think. Yeah, so, so. I, I started as a social worker um, and working with um, a lot of, uh, with children from, you know, all sort of different backgrounds and, um, and I found that um, using the arts in general, but mostly um, film was a great tool for them to be able to to express themselves and um, be aware of certain issues. There was a bit of a you know a way of showing them a window into other people's um, world and um, realize that you know they're not on their own. That other people share you know um, their concerns and so it was. I've, I've always felt like film was a really powerful tool um, to work with children. Um, and so I guess that's how I kind of got into to working in film. Um, so I've always felt like, yeah, documentary especially, but I mean, all, all sort of films were, for me, a, a great social um, tool and, and a very important way, yeah, for, to be able to tell people's story. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always felt cinema was a, a really important part of people's lives. How did you make that step from what you were doing previously to get into film production? Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm French, so I, I started you know my, my career in France and and um, so working with children and working um, uh, with organisations that were you know helping children through their through their issues with them as the as the tool to you know to help them tell their story. And, and from that, I, I ended up working um, for uh, for a cinema in France that had um, a big component of um, social work and working with schools and and um, and so I kind of fell into that more kind of um, cinema management kind of role and, and from there I went to work for the Cannes Film Festival um, mm -hmm. in the education department and then I moved to Australia and I ended up working for the Melbourne International Film Festival and when I got to to MIF I just realised that um, no one 
you know, under 18 was allowed to go to the festival, and I just thought, this is crazy. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I started, I, I created a whole program for children, and, and from there I just also worked across short films, and, and, and through that just really discovered this amazing community of filmmakers in Melbourne, and really wanted to, to be involved in really, um, you know, with creative people and, and, and helping them put their story on screen. Yeah, and that's still going, the Next Gen program at MIF. The Next Gen is so, very successful. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent that you found another community that needed the support of um, film and that's you brought right. it to them. Yeah. Um, Sari, can you talk a little bit about how you got into film and what you think it offers? Yeah, I think, um, I think ever since I was really little, I always responded to cinema and well, cinema, VHS is at home. Uh -huh. um, and, I, and I loved it. And I loved it in high school as well. And I think something a bit weird happened when I finished high school and it was that choice to go to uni and I got into go to film school and then I got into just to do an arts degree and I decided to do an arts degree and I, saw, I let go of the, the stuff that I had loved about film and then and I found history, which I, I loved as well, that that became, you know, the, really the basis of my arts degree and I did my honours in history. And it was... Um, and I think maybe it's like at that age not having the confidence to know what you want to do and taking the safer option. And it was when I finished university that I realised that I really didn't want to be a historian, that I wanted... I had this quiet feeling that I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I was working as a research assistant for a historian and I was spending every day in the microfilm machines before everything was online. And I found this really weird story about um, a furniture factory in Texas which had hired chimpanzees to work in the factory. And I, was, and I just thought that was such a weird story. I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a film about that. So I was started my, started my career as kind of a research assistant as a historian. And then I was quietly making this stop motion um, documentary animation about chimpanzees working in a factory in Texas. Um, and it was something I could do by myself, you know, quietly. No one apart from my housemates knew that I was doing this very weird, strange side <laughs> project. Um, but it was by doing that, um, just kind of quietly and slowly by myself, that I realised that that is what I wanted to do. And it, ever since, it's been about balancing kind of that love of of history and research and then finding new ways of telling stories. And I think that's why I love film is that, that, and documentary, is that it's such a creative space to be able to talk about things and, and say things in new ways. Do you feel like it kind of allows you to be a historian still, but like bring stories into the present and make things alive again rather than researching like a past and, and keeping it in the past? Yeah, I think um, there's so much that I love about about history and the discipline and the, um, you know, the rigour and the detail and the nuance of it. Like, I've got, I've got a real heart for academia. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but I think, I think it is about um, being able to do, distill a story and to make the past relevant um, and to make, as you said, make the past alive that, that film can do in a way that's different to straight history. Um, yeah, so you've worked with Chloe. Um, mm -hmm. as a pro Chloe's produced one of your films. Yeah. Um, and Chloe's also produced one of Santilla's films. Um, that, so did you want to talk a little bit about working with Chloe um, and <laughs> <laughs> how, how it has been to like work with the kind of the same producer and do you cross paths on your projects at all? Um, and what, what it's been like, you know, building your stories with another um, woman who's so open to, to doing all of this sort of thing. <laughs> do you want to go first, Andrew? Um, what do I like about working with Chloe? <laughs> it's like an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can just, is that, just say Do you something? want to leave the room? <laughs> um, I, I think what I, what I love about working with Chloe is you can bring any idea to her and she is very, very open to it. Like, I, I love that we can... Inter I mean, at the moment, we've sort of got a few projects that we're developing together um, between scripted and, and, and factual, and all of them are very different. They're very, very different stories. But when I have come to her with those ideas, she's been very open in engaging with the subject matter. Um, she has... 
she has an awareness of the world around her, which is very important for me to collaborate with people that are very aware, because the issues that my work explores is, is, is quite, you know, I, I look at contemporary migration, I look at cultural identities, and I also inter uh, I look at in, and interrogate politics. So I need, for me, to work with people that understand all of that stuff and with Chloe I've never felt that she wouldn't doesn't get it or doesn't understand it if anything she brings more to the process and even just developing stuff with her I mean she'll interrogate a lot of the I mean uh, one of the scripted projects that we're working on has been really really wonderful for me because I come from a journalist background so it's it's been really really nice to enter story a scripted bit of work and have it interrogated in a way that it, you know, a sub would a news story, which has been really, really nice because it's 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 brought out my strengths in that in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, but I think the most, like I said, the most important thing for me has has been working with someone that actually has an understanding of the issues that the work explores, but also has a deep empathy for the subject matter and and really cares about why these stories need to be told and why they should be told and isn't doing them because it's in fashion, it's tokenistic, it's because that is also happening, especially around the conversation around diversity, where people just want to get into stories because they're different or because sure. they're being funded, but actually someone who actually really genuinely um, engages with that because that's just how the world presents to her as well. Yeah. So what is your role as producer? Do you see all of this as, as well, accurate in yeah, getting Yeah, it's interesting. Forward? I mean, um, obviously, you know, Santi and Sari have, you know, very two different... Um, person and they have very different interests mm -hmm. and that's what really is fascinating but the thing that both of them have is that they have a really I mean they're very curious but also they they want to explore different ways of saying their story um, they you know they're not um, they're not trying to to you know um, fit in a box or they just really um, want to explore um, you know, in the way they, you know, they tell the story, you know, um, we'll see Santi's film, for example, a bit uh, later, and, you know, about the way she, she worked with, you know, the texture, the colours, the, she, you know, she, she's an artist in, in so many ways, and it's the same with, with Sari, she's, you mm -hmm. know, she's passionate about the, her subject matter, but she's going to find ways to tell in the story in, in, in completely, you know, you know, sometimes experimental way, but that is very just rich and new and exciting, and, and that's what I, you know, really loved about the collaboration with those two beautiful women. But um, yeah, so I think I, you know, it's it's filmmaking is a collaboration process, and that's mm -hmm. you know what's the you know the, the the core of you know being able to um, you know to work together and and and. Uh, the role of the producer, I mean, the way I see it, I think there's so many different ways you can be a producer. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not a, an expert um, in any means, but um, I see my role, you know, working with, with Santi and Sari a little bit as, you know, a bit like a midwife. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that. Um, because, you know, you, you know, they have these babies that they, you know, been carrying for so long, <laughs> and they really <laughs> want to put them out in the world. <laughs> yeah, and um, and I see my role as you know the person who's going to support them mm -hmm. and nurture them and um, care for them uh, the whole way through until mm -hmm. you know um, the baby comes out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and even to now to this <laughs> panel discussion. And I mean, I think on on a day like International Women's Day, yeah. Yeah. what I love about the you know the midwife metaphor is mm -hmm. that producers are generally dudes. And I can't mm. really see um, like a male director being like, I see my producer as a midwife. <laughs> you know, like it's we, our relationships are kind of seen through our female experience yeah. and that, um, and that to me, the midwife is what is the perfect analogy for what Chloe does as a producer because there is no way that film is coming out without a support. <laughs> Should we watch... Um Santi film short film now, mm -hmm. and then do you, are we happy to show it? And yeah. then we can talk uh, through it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, do I need to do anything with this? No. Okay. <laughs> the first time I realised I wasn't just black, but very black, blue black, very black, midnight black. I was on a school excursion to Canberra and someone confused me for a black marble sculpture of a dead colonizer. I 
I've learned to sit very still in public and limit my movements to make people comfortable and unafraid. People aren't expecting a thing as black as me to be real, to be human. This was something I had to get used to. When I was a young girl, I didn't have an understanding of what racism was. I didn't see myself. I didn't exist. It wasn't that I hated how I looked, but there was this sense that I must be unattractive, even if I didn't feel it in my body. I must be unappealing. I must be ugly. I've learned people are incapable of seeing anything other than blackness and what my skin colour means to them. But I can't change how I'm seen. There's only so much bleach in the world and no surgeon could ever make me look like the little blonde girls I went to school with. This is my reality. I have learned to be proud of and to accept who I am. I am a Tonga Tem. I am an artist and I am a black woman. wonderful so do you want to talk about how it came to to be in that process how the, the length was sort of decided on and the um, images versus the the voiceover I don't know if you we want could to probably put the um, yes. presentation yes so we have a presentation with images from the film yeah. can we hook that up oh. okay. um, so the length was dictated by Screen Australia and News Limited because it was part of an initiative um, called Doco 180, um, which was a call to female filmmakers to make a piece of work that was about three minutes, 180 uh, seconds, to, to get people to really think about issues that relate to Australian women that we don't necessarily... Um, think about and I had known of a Tem, uh, a Tong's work um, for many many years. Um, I'd seen her stuff on social media because she's 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 quite a prolific um, Instagrammer, um, and she's a visual artist and she's also a photographer. And um, a friend about two or three years ago sent me an essay that she wrote, where she was talking about how she was reconciling. Uh, you know, being dark-skinned and the challenges of being, um, uh, you know, being born dark-skinned, living in Australia and experiencing racism, but then also colorism, which is essentially discrimination within your own group because, you know, it's a complicated thing, but the way it works is that the darker your skin tones are, the more discrimination you face within your own community versus if you're lighter skinned and generally most opportunities tend to go to women that tend to be light skinned so if you think about your Beyonce's and all those sorts of people um, um, that is the standard of beauty and the pressure to conform to that so there's a lot of stuff around skin bleaching and all that sort of stuff so she wrote this essay at about 24 or 25 and she talked about how she re was reconciling all of that and how she um, you know, got to a place where she was comfortable in her own skin and she, despite the pressure of her own family to want to lighten her skin tone, to fit in and to be accepted, she chose to just, you know, be like, this is who I am. And, 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 and I thought it was a very courageous thing because, you know, I've, I've got my own family members, I've got all hues of black in my family from the lighter skin to the darker skinned. And I've got cousins that have lightened their skin and, and you know, that the conversations come up all, all the time and, you know, I've, I've had moments, especially when I was younger growing up, sort of thinking maybe I should lighten my skin tone, maybe that would change my own, um, you know, outcomes. 
um, in that sense and maybe I might be a little bit more beautiful. So to, to see someone or to read about someone who had that much confidence at such a young age to really own her identity as a woman, and especially because she came from a group that is obviously very underrepresented in Australia and in Australian media, really, really moved me um, on an emotional level. But I'd always wanted to tell her story and didn't quite know how I could tell it. Um, and then when this initiative came up and, uh, you know, her work is very visual. It, it really is as bright and, and, and striking as you, as you see in the film. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to really, you know, get her to present herself as an artist with her work, but also to tell her story. And, um, and I just, and I, and I, and I, and I just was like the opportune um, environment. And to do it in, in three minutes was wonderful because um, I didn't want to drag it up for too long, but I was also aware that this is an issue that most people aren't familiar with, you know, whether it's racism, whether it's colorism. And so I didn't want to introduce a subject in a way in which you had talking heads and people were sort of speaking to something, which is why it's, it, we have all the beautiful visuals. Um, because there's just no foundation for it. And I also didn't want to, because um, we, we have an aversion to talking about race and racism in this country, so I didn't also want to make anything that made people in, you know, overtly uncomfortable. But it was also, it's also very uncomfortable when you're watching it as well. But um, that was all part of the process of putting it together. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You sort of touched on this a little bit when, you know, making people uncomfortable and mm. you don't want to do that, but, but by nature of the... Oh, topic, but I do, it, but, it then, does. but then I kind of want to bring them in sure. with to make it look beautiful so that it's like, you know... But um, I'm very interested in... I, I think that, you know, uh, being uncomfortable is a good thing. I think that it, it forces us to really question ourselves and our places in the world. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm interested in the response to the film, I suppose, and like, you know, has it been, I guess, as you intended or you could have intended any number of things? And It's been really interesting. I mean, because it was initially, the whole thing was supposed to be on social media. It was a social media sort of thing and it was, it was the film was supposed to be on, on, on Facebook and have a life on there and... Um, I was aware that News Limited had commissioned it, so I was also thinking about the Herald Sun readers and sort of thinking, are they really <laughs> going to get this? <laughs> we had a lot of conversations about that. Um, and, you know, it's been interesting reading the social media comments because a lot of people have had um, quite a bit to say. A lot of it has been quite unsurprisingly um, racist. There's been a lot of stuff that's been said um, a lot of people have said to, you know, commented that Tong should, you know, if she doesn't like it here, then she should go back to where she came from, which is really strange because it's like she's not saying she doesn't like Australia. She's just talking about her experiences. Um, and I've found that to be quite interesting, just how people, some people have reacted in that way to someone owning and standing firm in who they are. Um, but then it's also received, you know, it's it's now gone on to have a life. I mean, it's had a theatrical release, which has been really, really great. It's going to be playing at a bunch of festivals, and people have found the work, not just here in Australia, but around the world, and they're really, it's resonated in, in, in many ways. Um, because it's, it's a story, obviously, um, you know, within an Australian context of a black African woman, but I think in many ways it speaks to a lot of issues that women face, which is why we have her at the beginning with these layers on that she's removing. And I think any woman understands the process of putting makeup on and stripping that back to reveal who you really are. And so as much as it's about her specific um, issues, I think many women can relate to feeling like you're hiding behind something to, you know, and, and, and yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you are, with this story, with this mm. film, like, uh, I suppose, filling a gap um, in the documentary landscape or just in the cultural landscape, um, that something that wasn't there before, mm. that, you know, you are putting something essential out there that, that feel you feel needs to be told. Um, and, I mean, all three of you do that, I think. Chloe, you work mm. with uh, filmmakers that do so. Sari, you've done the same thing with your work. Um, and so um, how do you feel that that works? I mean, perhaps we can continue to talk about um, Santilla's film, but also talk about your work and how that, um, how you see it in the landscape of documentary what more widely in Australia. Um, I think, 
I, I feel like I, I want to be an optimist and talk about all the good things that are happening <laughs> right now. And I think that it is, it's changing. Um, and I think that we need, um, you know, far reaching diversity in how we tell stories and who gets to tell stories. And I think that, um, and that's, that's what the censorship project really at its heart is about, um, which is censored the film that me and Chloe are just finishing now. Um, that project is, um, it was a follow on from a short film that I made um, where I found this collection of all the little bits that had been cut out of films um, that were imported into Australia in the period 1958 to 1971. So at that time, films were imported by ships. The government would have a watch of them, take out any bits that they thought were, you know, obscene, um, and then they put them away. And um, I found this collection, I sort of stumbled upon it, um, and that became the basis of this long-running um, experimental documentary that Chloe and I are just about to finish. Um, so <laughs> that was from a year and a half ago, and we are not making that film anymore. <laughs> um, and because what happened, I mean, there's hints to it in that trailer, like so much of the stuff which the film ended up is in, buried in there. But it started as this project that it was about liberating this archive so we could see all the things that we missed and how terrible and repressive censorship was. But then when I sat down to watch the 2,000 odd clips that had been censored, I have no other words than I fucking hated it. Like, I hated watching it, and it was difficult, and it made me deeply uncomfortable, and it was because it was an entire, entire collection of films directed by white dudes. And you see the same stuff over and over mm -hmm. and over again. And so the film is about, well, what, how, do, how do we deal with this, and what place does a feminist filmmaker in 2017 or 18 now, have in liberating a collection of the male gaze, a collection, collection that objectifies women. So it's been quite a journey to try and figure all this out. And it's been so interesting just to be finishing this film just as we are in the midst of this international conversation about not only the politics that happens behind films and how films are made, but also about well, what's actually happening in front of the camera, what things do we keep on seeing, and um, why women keep on having to see things that, um, which reduces and limits us. Sounds like you're uh, kind of taking the, these elements of the male gaze and representing them, perhaps. Mm. I mean, I, I don't know what this film will be like and whether it will contain that journey yeah. or just be a different, a different product, but that you are presenting um, a really essential women's gaze in on screen, which is something that we have only we we do see more and more and more of, but have only seen in particular eras in really limited ways. Yeah, I'm I'm I don't know whether I wouldn't say that we're successful in creating a a female gaze, but I think what we're doing is repackaging the male gaze so you can't deny it. And I think that some of my experience of um, of watching it with people is that I feel like often women are like, oh yeah, like I understand this. And for for men, there's kind of there's sort of two options, and one is a deep sense of shame or a deep sense of defensiveness. Um, and it's really in I feel it's quite kind of stark um, how people respond to it. And I think, but for women, it's like. This is something that I feel like I've always known, but I never quite could put my finger on it. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and so I wonder, like, what... Because you've worked in a number of different formats and you've screened your films overseas. Um, have you travelled with your films overseas to, to screen them? Or? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see... I, I'm, you know, terrified and <laughs> interested to see how people are going to respond to this work because I think one of the things that's so clear at the end of it is that we don't, uh, and we don't have the answers. I don't have the answers. I just create a lot of problems in creating this work. 
Um, but at the same time, I thought it was better to create some problems and ask some questions rather than pretend like this archive doesn't exist, which was definitely tempting. Um, but that's why you need a good producer to keep you going when you really feel like you're lost and you have no idea how to get through. Yeah. It's interesting you're talking about international. I mean, we, we don't know how this film will, you know, work internationally because it's such an Australian, um, you know, mm -hmm. film. I mean, it's, you know, I think a lot of other country would not have had that censorship and would just be like, what did you guys do? <laughs> I mean, you're crazy. Um, but it, it, by Sarah's work, it's, it's transcended that. It's, it's no longer an Australian film. It's really... Um, you know, how we make film is, you know... Yeah, it's interrogating as larger Interrogating, issues. you know, mm -hmm. as, as, you know, a spectator, what do we watch? Are we, you know, so comfortable watching, you know, those films that use the same tropes over and over again? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do we evolve from that? So I think, in my, yeah, I think I'm confident that it is more than an Australian, you know. Yeah, I mean, do you think that it's really important that your work as Australian filmmakers... Um, can reach out to a more global audience and that I know that you do, I mean, essentially you spoke to how this, you know, is your film does speak to something of a universal audience rather than just the experience of being in Australia. But is it is it important as filmmakers, I'm kind of broadening the documentary landscape to appeal in some ways to a global audience? I think I naturally just think about the world just because that's just how the world presents to me. Mm -hmm. So my work is very m much centred in an Australian context because that's where I live my life. But I also am aware that I live in a bigger... I live on a planet with seven billion other people. And um, I think I'm always interested in how, how that... how we're all interconnected and how you know, someone living in London can connect to an Australian story because I also do want to open up Australia through film um, and show that we are more than our own tropes, mm -hmm. which I think has carried on for a long time. But I was just thinking when Chloe was talking then and when Sari was talking about, you know, your initial question about why we entered film, I think for me, I got to a point where I realised that I actually had something to say that I felt wasn't being said and I got tired of the tropes and I got tired of the fact that um, I couldn't see contemporary Australia on screen. Um, and the only way to fix that is to just get stuck in and make, make work. I, I don't think I necessarily enter my work thinking about um, my gaze. I don't, think, I don't go into it explicitly thinking about what, you know, is this a female gaze, et cetera, et cetera. Because when I look at all my projects, my protagonists are all very different. I mean one of the scripture works that we're working on, the protagonist is male, and you enter his world through his experience and his life. Um, another one features a, a, a teenage girl, so it's different protagonists. Um, and for me, the most important thing is that I, I want to bring people from with different experiences living in an Australian context, because that's the... the big connection to all of them is that all of the stories are centred here, but the people come from different backgrounds, different life experiences, um, which it, which opens it up to the world. And I think it's very important that, that we get a better sense of who we are. And interestingly, Sari was talking about the importance of history and the importance of documenting. And I think that we haven't really done a good job historically documenting where we've been and where we are and film is very essential in that. I think that when the more work that we have that speaks to where we are right now and speaks to some of these issues is incredibly important because, you know, 20 years down, down the line you want young people or people that are coming up, they can access this kind of work. They can kind of go, actually someone had tried to do something or try to speak to it and then they can build on it. But we can't really have progress if we don't actually have anything that there's a foundation to, to, to work from. And I think that's why cinema is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's great that you're... I mean, you've, you mentioned tropes and Australian film tropes and Australian cultural tropes, and mm. they've been so limited for so many decades. Mm. So it's really you know, important to add to that and expand, expand on that work. Um, 
Because they're yeah. just, I mean, you just walk down the street in Melbourne, there's so many interesting stories, there's mm -hmm. so many things that are going on. Any person in this room tonight can tell you about the encounters that they've had and the people that they speak to, but you will not see that reflected. You won't see that, and that's a disappointment, you know, because we are, we are richer, you know, and we're denying ourselves that richness. Um, and I, I have just made it a mission to... Um, tell my version of Australia. <laughs> Everyone else can tell their version, but I'll tell my version and that's what that that that's kind of what excites me. Yeah, well I guess that's all you can do, isn't yeah. it? Just tell yours and that's I mean that's why you're here. That's what's important is that we're getting perspectives from a more diverse range of people and a whole bunch of women as well, um, which is which is really key. Do you think I'm just going to we're going to throw it to audience questions in a little while, but do you think that there you feel like you have a really supportive um, creative industry in Australia to help you. I mean, we, we have Chloe, obviously, who's doing wonderful work, <laughs> you've mentioned, but is there overall, like, um, in terms of what's available to you, um, in terms of marketing, distribution, or um, other creative support, other writers, actors, that, researchers that you could work with? Is it a really strong, thriving environment right now? Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think, it's a hard funding environment mm. in Australia, and I don't. Th I, it just is. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I think that you you find your strength in your collaborators, um, with your peers, kind of connecting with people whose work you like. And I think, um, you know, for me, that's one really valuable thing about working in a, a small context like Australia, that you can love someone's work and reach out to them and say, "I love your work," and that's the beginning of you know, connecting with people. So I would say that, um, you know, that it's, it is about finding, finding people who you enjoy creating with and finding people who you love their work um, and not lending something which is very difficult, like the funding um, landscape, to, to get you down. It's, it can be really difficult when you're trying to do things, you know, a little bit differently. And if, you know, if you're trying to to mix different creative mediums, you know, like I, one of the things I love is, you know, be able to mix, you know, film with dance or music or, you know, all these kind of in-between projects that, you know, um, makes the work richer and and, um, and that that's why it becomes even harder because, you know, it, it falls between, you it's know. It's harder to write a pitch about it. It, it is. <laughs> and, and, but, but that's, I think that's where the richness is and that's where, you know, there's so much to explore. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's why, you know, stories like, you know, Sari's stories or Santilla's story can be, can be told. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you want to add anything, Santilla? I'll just echo what they both said. I think I agree with Sari. I think it's a very difficult climate to make films in just because there isn't a lot of funding. Um, and also because I think we're culturally just very risk averse in Australia in terms of backing ideas that are a bit bold, a bit ambitious. Um, and it would be nice to see a little bit more risk taken in that sense because I think it pushes people creatively. Um, but in, in terms of the support, I, I, I felt quite supported. Um, and, you know, I've got Chloe, she supports <laughs> me, and um, Sari is a great supporter too. So it's nice to have conversations with other filmmakers about some of the difficulties of the industry and knowing that you're not alone and knowing that, because it gets hard, like it's not, it's not the easiest industry to enter. It's not one where, you know, you, I mean, you're lucky if you're going to make a lot of money from making films in this country, but you do it because you genuinely love what you do. And most of the time it's harder. Um, and it's, and, and you, you, you just need to surround yourself with people that are supportive, are supportive of the ideas, but it's importantly supportive of the story and why the story should be told. Um, because that's what carries you through to the end. And that's why you just keep going through the torture over and over and over and over again. <laughs> And then you can have some beautiful outcomes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, do we have time? Do sorry, we didn't get a chance to show the short the trailer for oh, the no, paper trail. I Did think you that's wanna? okay. No, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Okay. We've got okay. Shall we do it? All right. Let, I feel like um, on this International Women's Day, I would like to show this trailer to celebrate the most badass woman I ever had the pleasure <laughs> of hanging out with. Hi, sorry. It's Anne here. I'm glad we're going to do the film. I'm getting much worse. The Alzheimer's is getting worse. 
So come quickly while I'm still here. <laughs> Ann Deverson, journalist, broadcaster and documentary filmmaker, a celebrated writer and a royal commissioner. We've generated some good archival material here. So have you gotten rid of some material that you don't want people to see? I'm not going to answer that. You know, sometimes I think that truly we undertake heroic journeys, often stumbling, sometimes blind. I promised my mother that I wouldn't hitchhike. But I'm afraid the adventure was far too great for me to resist. Fascinating how many people seem to put labels around my neck. But are you really representing the majority of women in the country? All of us carry memories. We carry memories of people, those we love, who've died. We, we carry all these memories that keep shifting and changing. Why should we be any more ashamed of an illness that affects our mind than an illness that affects our body? Already words are disappearing like confetti. Names vanish overnight. Wait. Give me a chance. I don't have one storyline. I have many storylines. It makes me feel tired looking at them. Just quickly, I know that that's screened online for a while, I think, but is there any way that it's, is it going to screen um, in public later? Or? Yeah, I think, um, I think it might have a little bit more of a festival life coming up. Okay, but all right. You can keep mum on that. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's being live streamed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, great. So I think now um, we will open to audience questions, if there are any. I can see Pippa has a roaming mic. So... If anyone has a question for anyone, um, I can't quite see. Yeah. Okay, so um, in today's world, I think we do jobs that our parents don't really understand and it can make them frustrated when their friends ask, you know, what, what are their kids up to and they can't tell. So um, <laughs> my question is two parts. What is um, kind of your biggest braggy story that you would tell your parents that they can pass on to their friends? And what is your biggest braggy story that you would tell your friends who kind of get what you do? Mm. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's hard. <laughs> oh, I think it... Oh. <sighs> I feel like I've got the answer for mine. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't achieved mine yet, but my mum tells me that I've made it when I meet Robert Redford. <laughs> um, so, Robert. <laughs> um, oh, and I don't know about bragging to friends. I think it's... No, I, I don't know. what. It, maybe it is when, you know, your films play at festivals. I mean, that's an amazing feeling. And um, particularly as... I, you, like, I have groups of friends who do very different things from me. Um, and and they they you know it is hard to really communicate what we do and how hard it can be, but those moments where you can show the work to your group of friends um, and your family is those are the nicest nights there is I think. I've got the problem that my parents don't speak English, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't even share my work with them. <laughs> they just stay blank, <laughs> but they yeah they they're very supportive and. Yeah, very proud. <laughs> um, I think I had the big challenge early on in my career where I, I was I studied medicine for a while, so I was supposed to become a doctor because that was what my parents wanted me to become, and um, I couldn't quite rationalise why I would enter a creative industry because they just didn't. It it just had never crossed their mind. They were just like, but why? Like, why would you do that? Um, and I remember the day that it clicked with my mum that this was actually something serious and maybe I should be taken seriously was I was work, I'd gone to do an interview in South Sudan just after it became independent and she was working there as well. And I was running around interviewing all these like officials and stuff and she saw me and she actually took a photo of me um, carrying out these interviews and she's like, oh, actually, what, you know, you, you, you do serious work. And when my mum loves... Um, celebrity magazines and so when Date My Race came out I think through uh, one of the 
women's tabloids had a thing about me. And um, that was a very proud moment for her. So she cut it out and she still has it and she's like framed it. So in her, in her <laughs> mind, I've, I've achieved something. So she's actually turned out to be one of my biggest supporters. In, but my friends don't quite get what I do. Like they get what I do on a, an intellectual level, but they don't actually get because a lot of them are kind of going, well, why would you, why would you, why would you give up um, a lot of the professional careers in many senses, that, you know, giving up medicine the first time and giving up journalism to make films um, doesn't quite click with a lot of my friends um, and it's a hard one to explain because a lot of the time they just think that I'm just sitting hanging around just not doing anything um, so I don't I can't brag with my friends <laughs> <laughs> have nothing I could, I could use this actually I might be like hey <laughs> going back to my mum my mum is a midwife so I, I can say to her, no, no, I think we do the same job, which is yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I deliver babies too. <laughs> Amazing. Um, any other questions? Um, Chloe, you're, you were involved in Chasing Asylum. And I think that one thing that's really important, even with what you guys are doing now, is there's, a, there's an element of danger to making documentaries. They're a tough thing to make. I mean, often you are uncovering truths people don't want uncovered, and Chasing Asylum is a classic of that. But even Censored seems to be the same way, and, you know, even your film, Santi, seems to be, you know, raising issues people are probably happier if you don't raise. So I guess I'd be interested to know how you feel about the actual... just the sense of danger and the sense of actually confronting Australia with stuff Australia doesn't particularly want to be confronted with? Mm. <laughs> um, well, I, I think, I mean, I personally feel like it's, you know, one of the things that gets me out of bed every morning, you know, that um, just, you know, having this really strong belief and, you know, trying to, to get them out there and and um, you know, and, and telling stories, and um, you know, is taking risk. And you know, not everyone is going to agree with the stories you you know you're putting on screen. But um, I think you know that's that's part of you know what um, drives us all, I guess. Mm. And I think um, those dangers. I, I I find the kind of the idea of um, the idea of you know kind of it being dangerous or kind of upsetting people less um, troubling or difficult to deal with than I think that I, when I think about the ethics in the work mm. that I do, that that feels like, um, you know, like I don't worry at night about um, about it being dangerous, putting it out, but I do worry about how, how I've gone about it. Like, am I being, am I being truthful? Has my process been good? Has, um, Am I being kind of respectful to stakeholders and people involved? And that's the thing um, that is very dis difficult territory in documentary um, is to, to navigate your ethics and to feel like in putting these stories out into the world, you're doing the, what you think is the right thing. I would agree with both Sari and Chloe. I think that, um, I think for me, one of the, things that I love about film is that, you know, there's a deep responsibility when you're bringing people's attention to something. There's, you know, whether whether or not I think about it consciously, um, people are leaving with something. So my responsibility is therefore to really consider what I'm trying to say and why I'm bringing people's attention to something. And I think that we're living at a time when there is a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of, you know, fake news or whatever you want to call it. And I think it is incredibly worrying. I'm a firm um, believer in democracy and the importance of democracy and for people to be informed and to be informed well. And I feel like a lot of the institutions that are supposed to be doing that are really failing um, citizens. And I think that um, if there is a role that film can play in at least getting people to ask those tough questions about their place in, in their own democracies and make informed choices, um, then I'm willing to take that risk and it's not something that I shy away from. But I'm also fortunate because I have people that are constantly supporting me in, in, in being bold to take those risks. I mean, you know, 
um, Rob, you know, has been really supportive in that sort of sense. I mean, we have conversations where he's just like, you know, just make it political, like, you know, go for it, like, do it. Like, and that in itself is, it's, it's a gift. Like, it's a really big privilege to have people that are in your corner that are saying that this is important, it needs to be told. Um, and that's why we all do what we do. And it, it outweighs any of the, the other stuff that comes along. Um, for me, anyway. And, and if, for example, a, fi a film like Black As Me, I mean, um, you know, it played in cinemas and it played in, um, in festivals and, and it got really well received. And, and But that's because the people who come to that, you know, I often, you know, agree with, you know, the story. Mm. But putting it out on News Limited, that's where you take your risk because, mm. you know, all the sentence it's going to be in front of people that, you know, don't necessarily agree with what you have to say and that's the hardest as a filmmaker because you get you know told that you know um, what you're saying is you know is bad or whatever and you know people are very harsh in their comments and mm. but that's you know that's where you want to have your story you know because that's where it creates discussion and you know you feel like you you know you're pushing um, you know people's you know perception and views and, and that's what's important I think. And yeah, and when you're pushing into those difficult places, it's that's what's so wonderful when we're talking about film as a medium, is that it's because it is so collaborative. You have so many people in your corner, like you have your producer, Chloe, and you, <laughs> Chloe, everyone's producer, but you have Rob Connolly, and you have, you have champions and people who built and made something and believed in it with you. So when the shit hits the fan, you've got your, you've got your people, mm. and I think that's such an important thing. Yeah. And I think we've, we've all had, you know, mentors, mentors, and that's, they, they have been very important in our lives. Mm -hmm. and, mm. and, and men mentors as well. I mean, yeah. we talk about Rob because, you know, he, he's my boss and he's, you know, being uh, executive producer on, on all those films. But, you know, he's, he's, he's someone who's championed us and, he's, you know, he has our back. And it's important, I think, in a collaborative process to always have people like that that you can always <coughs> fall back on to. Yeah, who are established mm. in the industry and who can then be a supporter mm. for new voices. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. I think we are out of time. Um, so I wanted to thank you for coming and giving a beautiful panel. You have all done so much work, so much more work than we got a chance to talk about. Um, so that's a real shame, but you have output that's out there so, so everyone can... Um, look into your your work profiles if they want to. Um, anyway, thank you for coming, for doing such important work, and thank you to all of you as well in thank the audience you. for coming. Um, anyway, happy International Women's Day. Yay. Yay. There's a few hours left, so <laughs> let's go and celebrate. <laughs>